at uh, three o'clock. So uh, if we have your permission, we could begin if you like. Sure, sure perfect. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Are the fellows also present? Uh, uh, um, is everybody, the, who's the administrator today? Is everyone here? Aswini ji, aap dekh rahe hain, recording shuru kar li. System analyst sun rahe hain. SPRO ji sun rahe hain aap? Sir, sun rahe hain. Shall we start? Yes, we can start, sir. Uh, Ashwini se contact nahi ho raha hai, sir. Ashwini ko call. Recording is started, sir. Recording is started. All right. So, we are going to start. And I want to see... Can you arrange it so that I can see Dr. Shekhar Mande's screen, please? Hello. Would you like to see my screen? Yes, uh, that's good. That's fantastic. Uh, and uh, SPRO ji, minimize kijiye. I want to see uh, Dr. Mande. Maybe I am supposed to do this at my end. I don't know. But I think administrators normally do it. But let us begin. Uh, so, friends, we are really fortunate to have a very distinguished speaker in our uh, distinguished lecture series. As you know, we started this webinar series to try to imagine a world after COVID, and especially India's position in the world. We've had uh, very distinguished speakers in the past, including General Sayyid Atta Hasnain, and uh, we've also had Mr. Navtet Sarna, former ambassador to the United States, among others. And uh, today, we move to a slightly different area, which is science and technology. And I'm delighted that we have with us Dr. Shekhar Mande, whom I deeply admire. I'll tell you why in two minutes. But uh, uh, I must also say that a part of our mandate, as you know, is to reflect deeply. We have uh, President Radhakrishnan's uh, portrait just behind me. He was the founder of Indian Institute of Advanced Study. And he believed that there should be a place in India where we can reflect deeply about problems that confront humanity and also include natural sciences, mathematics, not just humanities and social studies, not just philosophy, history, literature, which we normally do. So as a part of that, uh, should I say, our core thrust area, I'm afraid we haven't done as much as we would have liked in the field of science and technology. And... Uh, perhaps call these late amends uh, in that direction. But no, a very brief introduction of Dr. Shekhar Mande, who actually needs no real introduction. But uh, I must say that it's a, it's a great privilege for us and a great honor because he's also a member of our governing body. And uh, uh, I must tell you, just to share with you, that uh, he's a very modest person, but he's a very upright person. So. He said, okay, I will, uh, you know, offer my lecture, but no honorarium for me because I'm a member of your governing body. So that's a jhalak aapko milti hai unke swabhav mein, is choti si cheez se. Lekin mein aapko ye batana cha raha hon sabko ke uh, Dr. Mande is one of India's leading scientists today. I think it would be um, not improper to describe him as a structural and computational biologist. You can correct me, Dr. Mande. But uh, uh, the little bit of research I did on you uh, uh, shows that that's your field. And uh, let me tell you, anybody who knows anything about science, there are three major science academies in India. And uh, he is an honorary fellow of all of them. He's also the winner of the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, which is the top award in science in India. Uh, his PhD is from Indian Institute of Science. He did his MSc from Nagpur. And then he went to the, the, the University of, of, of uh, Groningen, I mean, uh, I'm, I think I'm of, of Groningen, sorry, of Groningen, uh, the, the Ricks University of Groningen in Netherlands. It's a very old university. I think it was founded way back in the 17th century, around 1614, 15. It's a very prestigious university. He did a post of that. And then he went to the University of Washington in Seattle. He worked in a lab over there. And uh, after that, uh, he's, uh, he was a senior fellow there. And then he's held a series of top appointments in various CSIR institutions. Now, I want to tell you the second part of his uh, distinguished career 
which is that he is the DG of CSIR. CSIR stands for, uh, you know, the uh, our our premier, I would say, organization in India, which looks after science and technology. Uh, and uh, I I believe I may be wrong, but uh, you know, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in India (CSIR) is probably one of the biggest of such uh, organizations or institutions in the world. It has more than 8,000 scientists working full time. And uh, again, I, I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong, but they run more than 38, 39 top institutions in India, plus another 39 or so bodies which are affiliated uh, to uh, CSIR and uh, um, you know, they have innovation centers and uh, they have a staff of over, I think, uh, 1,400, uh, 8,000 technical and support personnel, outreach centers. And uh, I don't know for sure, but I, I, I can bet that their budget is over 4,000 crores. So I admire uh, Dr. Mande because, you know, frankly, I'm having a tough time running a very small institute. Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, very small. Our budget varies from 20 to 30 crores. He's handling 38 institutions, uh, and they are top institutions. I've dealt with some of them. I've lectured at some of them. Uh, CCMB Hyderabad, for example, or NCL, National Chemical Laboratory in Pune, which is a very old institute. And uh, I think he, he himself was in Hyderabad. Uh, at the DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics Institute, which I think was founded with the help of Sun Microsystems, if I remember reading about it way back. He also worked in Pune uh, at the Savitri Bai Pule University of Pune. He was the director of the National Center of Cell Science in Pune. So uh, a very distinguished record indeed. And uh, I was just uh, reading a little bit about CSIR. It's a uh, very old institution in India goes back to pre-independence days, 1942, September, I believe, when India was actually fighting the British in the Quit India movement. But the interesting thing there was that uh, the British in the early 40s, in 41, 40, around 1940, there was a proposal uh, to start an institution in India along the lines of DSIR, which was the British uh, uh, you know, uh, the British conducted their own uh, uh, scientific and technical um, research under the aegis of this uh, uh, body in Britain uh, called uh, DSIR. But, you know, the colonial government was not interested. They said, uh, you know, there was a committee, as usual, there were committees. Even today, there are committees. And uh, they said... Uh, uh, you know, we don't need, we don't need uh, such an institution in India. The Department of Science and Industrial Research was the British organization. And I think uh, Samuel Hoare was the Secretary of State to India at that time. But the point is the British resisted it, and then the Indians got together. Uh, we had a pioneering uh, Arcot Ramaswamy Mudalayar, who, who said, no, you know, India also needs this. And with a, with a modest budget of about one lakh rupees it was started. I only wanted to say that I've read uh, B.V. Subaramaya's history of uh, Indian Institute of Science because I did a little bit of work on that topic when I was researching on Swami Vivekananda and how they met, uh, uh, he met uh, Jai Tata on a ship, uh, you know, from Yokohama to Vancouver. So I found that the British were not interested in setting up IISC, even though uh, Jamshedji wanted to give a portion of his estate, one third of his estate, if I'm not mistaken. And the Maharaja of Mysore said, we'll give the land. And, and you know, Lord Curzon, who partitioned Bengal, he resisted it. And it's only when Curzon left India and Jamshedji already passed away that IISC was started. And I'm very proud to say as an Indian that CSIR has done pioneering research they have thousands of patents, and they're of non uh, uh, of non private organizations. I believe again, I stand to be corrected, but ninety percent of the patents out of India come from CSIR. And uh, the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, in the new educational policy, the, the document is out. I, ha I was 
privilege to see the draft and so forth. There's a huge thrust on science and technology. And programming uh, is going to start very early in sixth grade or so. And uh, if we want to be competitive, I think that we have to study science and math uh, from an early age. And, and I think both inculcate and foster a culture of excellence in India. And I think, uh, uh, I think CSIR is in the forefront of that. So with these words, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mandi, once again, over to you. I just wanted to say one little thing. We have a bit of a technical problem. You might have seen that there are three uh, links given to today's Cisco program. And that's because, frankly, we haven't been able to buy the corporate package yet because of certain difficulties. So we're going to get logged off uh, after 50 minutes. And let's take that as a nice little break. And we log back on with the second link and then with the third, if, if required. I apologize for this inconvenience. But until we sort out this problem, I think that uh, in, in abundant caution, we've offered three links. So, so over to you, Dr. Mande. And once again, uh, thank you so much. And, and welcome to the webinar series. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Paranspe, for the very nice words. Uh, uh, indeed, I'm very proud of my organization, uh, but uh, you are much more kinder to me uh, personally. So thank you so much. Uh, the organization that I head is indeed uh, the first publicly funded science and technology organization in the country. And as you correctly pointed out, uh, Sir Arkot Ramaswamy Mudliya, principally through his efforts, he was a member of British Commerce Council, and through his efforts that British agreed to set up what is called as the Board of Scientific and Industrial Research in Calcutta in 1940. Eventually, that metamorphosed into something called Industrial Research Utilization, uh, something like that. And then uh, it was uh, rechristened, and formally CSIR became an autonomous society in 1942. So 26 September 1942 is when we started. Uh, we started with roughly about one fifth of the grant from private sector. And uh, no guesses for uh, the right guess is Tata's came forward with a grant, a very handsome grant uh, to fund us to begin our thing. So uh, we started with five different institutes and Tata's actually gave a very handsome grant. And we also uh, experimented uh, perhaps for the first of its kind experience at that time is what today we call as crowdsourcing. And uh, okay, there was an appeal to the public to give money to start CSIR. And uh, uh, Tata himself, GRD Tata, he wrote a letter to Sir Shanti Suru Bhatnaga, our first director general, uh, a very nice letter in the history, which states that the people of Calcutta have donated something like 30,000 rupees but he was personally disappointed to see that people of Jamshedpur, all people together, have donated only 440 rupees. So that letter is in our archives. And it's a very nice letter. And incidentally, Katatas in between had forgotten to give the money. And then they were reminded. And in came an apology from them. Sorry, we had forgotten, but here is your money or something. So it was a very nice piece of history. But nonetheless, uh, we were the first organization to start in the country. And then post-independence, other organizations came, and many of them were directly born in CSI. Things like Department of Atomic Energy happened in the National Physical Laboratory Auditorium, the discussions. And uh, the people like Sir K. S. Krishnan, Homi Bhabha, and all of them were present there. Uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru made a very brief appearance. And uh, Sir K. S. Krishnan was very convinced. He said that if Bhabha says that there has to be Department of Atomic Energy, there will be one. And then the discussions are over. And that's how the DAE was born. And many other, uh, uh, our institutes in Bangalore, for example, like National Aerospace Laboratory, was the birthplace essentially of ISRO. And in the early days, uh, uh, many of the ISRO scientists would actually go to NL very frequently. And they would go to some of our other labs, such as the Central Ele Electrochemical Research Institute in Karaikudi, to take their help. People like Satish Dhawan and all. Uh, Dr. Kasuri Rangan, they would routinely drive to Karaikudi from Bangalore to start India, kickstart India space program. So uh, CSR in a sense has actually driven Indian s uh, system, ecosystem 
over the years since 1942. And what we'll do is I'll cover very briefly the history of science and technology in India. And then I will come to the present era, the COVID-19 era. And then I will have a chance to remark about uh, the post-COVID era and how science and technology would actually try to cope up uh, in that era. So let me share my PowerPoint slide with your permission. So, I hope you're able to see my PowerPoints. Professor Paranspe, are you able to see my PowerPoints? Yes, we are. We are. Absolutely. Sure. So what I would like to cover in the initial five minutes is general scientific development in the ancient times in our geographical region. And a couple of examples that I'm very fond of giving in uh, different places. There are many, many examples, but the two examples that I would have highlighted here is this one that all of you are aware of, currently at the National Museum in Delhi. This is the statue of the dancing girl from, uh, it's one of the most remarkable discoveries of the Harappa and Mohenjo-daro uh, excavations. Uh, this is actually about, uh, dated about two and a half thousand BC. And uh, it gave two very important leads about the kind of times of that era, uh, how people lived in that era. Uh, the first one is that the people of that era knew how to blend metals, cast them, and use other sophisticated methods, such as what we call as the lost wax technique. Now, it's absolutely remarkable that two and a half thousand BC, people knew how to do this, and amazing. And it has continued even today. These kind of uh, techniques are continued today. So this is a continuity in our culture since that particular era. But the second important finding of this is that entertainment was a part of the culture. Now remember, this is a dancing girl, and you can see her beautifully decorated with all the bangles all the way up to her shoulders and things like that. And uh, the art historians have gone on uh, describing the beauty of this particular girl. And uh, essentially, it says that entertainment was a part of our culture. It has always been a part of humanity from beginning, whether it be music or dance or other uh, sophisticated part of entertainments evolved uh, as we progressed, it has always been. But science and technology was an integral part of human development in this part of the geographical world. And that tradition continued very gloriously till about 18th century. Our science and technology has been absolutely marvelous till about 18th century. It's only after the uh, arrival of the British that some part of the tradition, we may say, was sadly lost. And uh, uh, kind of what has been forced upon us uh, are the views that science and technology develop only in the West, which are not the correct views. And a large part of science and technology happened even here, including calculating the planetary motions and the precise paths of the planets and the stars into the sky was done much before the Newtonian time in the West. There's a part of the tradition in which we knew metallurgy very well. Uh, we knew how to bend and ca cast metals. That also is a documented history and is absolutely marvelous if you actually go to that part of the history. And of course, uh, important documents about medicines, purely observational documents were also written in our country. So all of it, of course, was unfortunately forgotten after the British arrived here. But one of the other examples that I was also very fond of uh, 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 stating here is this particular example, that science and technology was not used for entertainment or the progress of humanity in general, but was also used for other purposes which would be very useful in the society. right? And it's here that the state played a very important role. The state in that sense, the emperors and the kings of that period played a very important role. And the example that I've shown you here is a dam on River Kaveri near Trichy. It's called the Kalanai Dam. And it is the oldest dam that is still in use anywhere in the world. This was constructed around 1st century AD. And uh, the state constructed a dam essentially for the part of irrigation, for the function of irrigation. It provided irrigation to the farmers. And the farming history in India also is extraordinarily rich. Uh, I have stated it here on the slide. I'm not going to go through that. But I have, what I've stated here is that 
the state always plays an important role in the development of science and technology as much as it has done in this part of the world so we should be very proud that science and technology has been thriving in the country till about 18th century and now once again in the past 20 30 years and odd science and technology has started once again looking up and will be able to match the west in every development that has been there in the coming few years so if you look at the modern history of snt in india post independence uh, we are very proud that india is one of the very unique countries which has ingrained in its constitution science and technology and scientific temper as a part uh, of our constitution so article 51a of the constitution of india if you look at uh, the sub clauses g and h they actually say that we must develop scientific temper humanism and the spirit of inquiry and reform as a part of our lifestyle so we should be very proud that we are a unique country in which constitutionally we are required to develop scientific temper now if we try to divide our modern history of science and technology in the country we can actually say that there are about four or five different eras that we can roughly divide it into in the pre independence era was essentially era of individual excellence where we had tall personalities like ramanujan raman the boses the sahas and so on and so forth they emerged at islands of excellence in different parts of the country but then came the era of self reliance when the british left us india's contribution to world gdp was less than 2% compare this when the british arrived it was of the order of about 30% so less than 2% gdp meant that we did not know how to make anything for ourselves including food just 4 years prior to attaining independence we went through a terrible famine an absolutely terrible famine which is a shame on humanity and during the british rule there is a famine in which millions died and therefore we had to make sure that we become self reliant on everything whether it be manufacturing whether it be clothing whether it be food whether it be agriculture whatever we had to become self reliant and the best course that we could have taken was to adopt science and technology as the vehicle of that particular growth and once again we are very proud that we have done that i'll give you one example of that in terms of democracy how democracy was implemented and how we made sure that every citizen gets the right to vote but i will come to that in the next slide next came the era of technology denial by the time our society had started already looking up in the 1970s when the atomic energy the space and the defense programs had taken off pretty well all of a sudden the world woke up and they started looking at india very suspiciously many people thought that india would become a superpower and then every possible technology was denied to india we were even not given computer graphics i remember as a phd student in indian institute of science bangalore in the 80s computer graphics were denied to india but then we resolved that if technology is denied to us we will generate our own technology and the results of that are for everyone to see our space program is such an exceptionally strong program that today any time there is a space launch india announces all the countries in the world line up for their own launch using india's vehicle 1990s saw another paradigm shift 1991 i don't have to state what it is uh, it actually made india as a part of the global world and all of a sudden because of that particular shift we realized that we must protect our intellectual property our awareness of intellectual property till that time was very low and in fact people had started obtaining patterns on traditional indian knowledge such as haldi or basmati rice and so on and so forth it is csir at that time stood up and went and fought in the international courts all these patents that had been granted for medicinal use of haldi and so on and so forth and that brought in a very strong perspective of ip protection in the country and once again i am very proud that csir actually brought this paradigm shift in the thinking in that era and then of course came the era of assuming global snt leadership that is the current era but for that we must look at also the covid 19 situation and how we are going to deal with the post covid 19 situation in the coming few time so this is the briefly the timeline of how different uh, snt organizations evolved in the country starting from 1942 uh, 
I told you, I will tell you a little bit about the implementation of democracy in the country. The first challenge post independence was to implement democracy and hold free and fair elections so that every citizen in the country gets a right. How would you ensure that? And what you see here are the two examples, one from the glamour world and another also from the glamour world, of course, to some extent, but from the political leadership world, you see that very proudly demonstrating that they have voted. And what are they displaying? They're displaying this ink on their forefinger. And this ink was developed in the National Physical Laboratory in New Delhi, the CSIR lab, the same lab where the DAU was born, I told you. And then the technology was transferred to Mysore Inc. in 1961. And even today, Mysore Inc. actually uses this particular ink in all elections. So all the audience here, here, I believe there is nobody who is less than uh, 21. Whenever we go to vote, remember, the ink which is put on your four fingers was developed in CSIR. But it's only one example. There are many, many such examples that we can actually go on talking about, and I don't want to do that today. Uh, the history of uh, development of science and technology for self-reliance itself is very fascinating in India. But I don't want to go into that detail today. Just what I want to say is that when we became independent, agriculture was our predominant sector of economy, but today is the services that dominates of uh, the thing. Let us come to the present era. That is the last six months, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Did we predict the pandemic before it uh, came upon us? The answer is yes and no. Indeed, for the last few decades, it has been predicted that the next pandemic of this kind is just around the corner. Many modeling techniques in epidemiology and all had predicted that indeed the pandemic is around the corner. What we did not know, it would be such a deadly pandemic caused by a virus such as the SARS-CoV-2. That was not predicted, but we knew that such pandemic is around the corner. And this is not the last of it that we are going to see. The coming few years, coming few decades are going to see even much worse pandemics. And therefore, we must be prepared and I'll come to our preparation for that towards the end of my talk. That's essentially what it is. This is the rough timeline of the current pandemic. It's in the last week of December that a cluster of pneumonia-like cases were reported in China, in the Wuhan province. And uh, over a period of time, we actually today have more than 16 million cases around the world that have been reported and a large number of deaths. The number of deaths will soon cross 1 million and that is a real matter of concern for most of us. In India too, the, uh, the numbers are very, very high. And we must actually think of how we are going to do, deal with this. CSIR, being a very multidisciplinary organization, did a review in January or February itself. We had a director's conference in uh, last week of February. This is much before WHO had declared uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic. And in our director's meet, we already discussed what we have on table and how we are going to deal with the situation uh, got forbidden it develops into a pandemic. And what we actually did on the left here, what you see here, is an analysis of what are the unmet needs and what would be the challenges. And I've listed it here, like limited diagnostics, capability and capacity, and so on and so forth. And what we launched eventually formally in the last week of March is a very uh, well thought and a coordinated program uh, on the COVID mitigation. And CSG is the CSIS strategic group on COVID-19, started meeting on the 29th March in the evening at six o'clock. And since that day till today, this group had met every single day at six o'clock in the evening. Even today, after this webinar, when I go home, I will go into the meeting of the strategic group in which we'll discuss about different updates on what we have done and what we need to do in the coming time. So CSIR strategy group has been meeting every single day to come up with science and technology solutions for the mitigation of COVID-19. And what we thought at that time, what we would do, we divided ourselves into five different verticals, what I've shown you on the left. For example, rapid and economical testing, digital and molecular tracing, trying to develop new drugs and repurposing and vaccines, then uh, making hospital assistive devices and generating supply chain logistics for support systems. There are two or three things that we agreed upon in March itself that what we are going to do is from beginning, we are going to involve India's industry in our fight against COVID-19. 
So in March, last week of March, before we start, installed, before we launched our strategic group, I contacted the chairman of all the major companies in the country. And I'm very pleased to say that people like N. Chandrasekharan, the chairman of Tata Sons, or Mukesh Ambani, the chairman of Elias Industries, and all of them, what you see here, all of them responded extremely positively. They wrote personal letters to me saying that we are with you in this particular fight. And this fight we have fought together with all major Indian industry and MSMEs. So we have had extraordinary support from the ecosystem in our fight. So what we have actually done in this entire thing, we have been able to come up with a couple of uh, new diagnostic kits that you will see in the market very soon. Today's gold standard is RT-PCR, and we are hoping that we'll be able to replace RT-PCR by the two diagnostic kits that we have come up with. And they are going to be marketed by Tata Science and Reliance. Similarly, we have done a very large scale tracing and epidemiological analysis of people who are antibody positive and so on and so forth. We have worked on repurposing drugs. Some of the examples that you have seen already in uh, popular media, for example, the Favipiravir drug, we launched a clinical trial about two months ago, and we have received an approval from the Drug Controller General India to use it for a restricted emergency use. And you would have seen that CIPLA, uh, in collaboration with CSIR, launched this drug about 15 days ago, and that has brought the price down of the drug. This particular drug, which was being sold in the market for about 100 rupees per uh, 100 milligram, now, because of CIPLA's thing and CSIS intervention, it is being sold for about 60 rupees. So we're able to bring the cost down by almost 40% for this. Similarly, a large number of hospital-assisted devices, PPEs, uh, ventilators and all, we are able to make it and we have generated them. So uh, basically what we would like to say that today I'm actually coming out of uh, a meeting with the Honorable Minister of Science and Technology, where we launched a technology portal of CSIR all the technology that are available in our uh, stable and the technologies actually we have made them public so that if anyone would like to include our technologies for commercialization they are more than welcome and help us in uh, scaling them up for the societal use so today only we have done that and it covers all the five portals that actually i've shown here but what we must discuss is that how do we prepare ourselves for the post covid 19 era so what i would like to do here is spend next about things about 15 to 20 minutes on our preparations for the post COVID-19 era. I would like to especially focus on uh, the Atma Nirbhar call the Honorable Prime Minister has given us, but I would also like to make comments about our preparation for future pandemics such as this. And what are the science and technology solutions that exist for any of these challenges that we are forcing? The first and foremost thing that I would like to appeal to the entire society through this webinar is to trust the scientists. Trust our scientists and technologists that faced with any situation, we can come up with very elegant solutions for their mitigation. Name any, any difficulty that actually is there in society, there can be very elegant science and technology solutions that exist or they can be evolved so that we can have solutions to all these problems. And let me give you some examples uh, in the next 15, 20 minutes of how we can actually deal with this. And one of the principal uh, thrusts of my talk would be, how do we achieve Atma Nirvarta in many of this? So what I'm going to tell you is mostly from the India's perspective, from India's perspective, but however, I will comment on the world perspective a little later. So if you look at India's imports today, and where do we import these things from, uh, it turns out that our imports are something like this. On the left-hand panel, our, about 20% of our imports are in crude petroleum. We also import a lot of coal. We import, uh, believe it or not, gold and diamonds. But we actually make jewelry and then we also export it. So this is actually a very thriving industry in India to import gold and diamonds, make jewelry and then export it. But this is the kind of profile that what we have in import. And today when we are meeting the Honorable Minister of Science and Technology for launching our technology portal, we also observed some very interesting imports. Not many people know that our essential ingredients on all Indian cooking are things like uh, hing and things like kesa. All of us use hing as a fodita in our uh, uh, cooking, right? We don't produce a single gram of hing in our country. It is all imported from Afghanistan and Iran. And now we have taken steps that a geoclimatic regions such as that 
also exists in India, especially in the upper reaches of Himalayas or in Himachal Pradesh, in such as Lahul and Spiti Valley. Geoclimatic wise, it's very similar to Afghanistan and Iran, and therefore we have started demonstrating now that hing can be grown even in our country. But it's a minor part. The major part, of course, is what I've shown you on this slide. And the right-hand panel tells you where do we actually import all these things from. And as you can see, in last about 15, 20 years, our dependence on China in terms of imports has grown, has grown significantly. We import about 15.4% worth goods from China into India. Some of these are also strategically very, very important. And therefore, we must sit back and think how we are actually going to get over this particular import problem from other countries. As I said, oil is crude oil is one of the biggest imports in the country. So what we decided is that we'll actually do some brainstorming and how we can actually get over this import uh, issue of crude oil. And together we thought that along with the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, along with the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, and so on and so forth, we can actually work together and reduce the target of these imports. If we can actually reduce the imports by something like 10 to 12% in the next five years, and we can actually reduce the imports by about 30% by 2030, we can in fact have a very ambitious target to bring down the crude oil import to zero by about 2040 or 2045. That's very ambitious, but nonetheless is possible. As I said, our crude import oil bill today is of the order of about six lakhs crore, right? And how do we do that? For example, today in our country, we use a lot of diesel, but diesel can also be generated from alternate sources. We can make biodiesel, we can make green diesel, and we can make bio-based ethanol and other uh, aspects. Gasoline, we can make bio-based ethanol. Aviation fuel, we have demonstrated that we can actually generate biojet fuel in our country. And in fact, some of you might remember, there is a maiden flight that took place in September 2018 that flew from Dehradun to Delhi. It's a spice jet flight that came and that ran, or uh, that flew on biojet that was converted in our laboratory in Dehradun. So CSR is a laboratory called Indian of Petroleum, and that actually flew the biojet. And then more than that, this year, on the 26th January and Republic Day, Air Force flew their AN-32 jets on the biojet fuel generated at IIP Dehradun. So what we have demonstrated is that many of these technologies are possible to do in our own labs, right? And the technologies that I have actually mentioned are also there uh, listed in the third column. And the agencies which can make it, CSIR being an integral part of it, but we can actually collaborate with many other agencies in the country to generate these technologies. So it is indeed uh, significantly possible that we can bring the oil imports to zero by 2040. But we should also then look at other sources of energy at the same respect. Alternative sources of energy, which are non-fossil fuel, is the need of humanity. And we are also looking at that very closely. The other thing that we actually import, and strategically what we realized is that we import a lot of chemicals from China. We are very proud of our generic pharma industry. Many of you recall our generic pharma industry, as it was maturing in the 70s and 80s, CSR played a very key role in the promotion of generic pharma industry. For example, in the 1980s, when the HIV drugs around the world the total HIV therapy would cost about $10,000 because of the intervention of CSIR and transferring technology to Indian generic pharma industry, we were able to bring down the cost to less than $100. And CIPLA took the all the technology for HIV drugs from us and then eventually WHO came around the corner and said that in countries of sub-Saharan Africa where HIV was raging or in Southeast Asia, India would provide drugs to all these countries at a much cheaper price. And we are very proud that catapulted Indian generic pharma industry. In the 80s and the early 90s, Indian generic pharma industry was making all the starting chemicals in India. Post-1991, over a period of time, the generic pharma industry also started importing some of the key chemicals and mostly from China. What we call today as APIs, or active pharmaceutical ingredients, 
and what we call as KSMs or the key starting materials for all of these, we started importing more and more from China. To the extent today India is dependent on China for the import of APIs. And the generic pharma industry imports these APIs, puts them into a capsule, and then sells it all over the world. Now, this is not a sustainable economic model for any industry. And when we talk to the pharma industry, we realize that they do indeed have their own concerns that if the APIs were made in India, the processes are not very cost effective. And that's exactly where the science and technology come in, can come into the play and make these processes so economical that the generic pharma industry will not have to import these chemicals from overseas. And this is exactly what actually CSR is targeting right now, is to help the pharma industry so that we become self-dependent or atmanirbhar, at least in the pharma industry. And we have actually identified number of APIs uh, that can be targeted and made very cheap in India. And I've just shown you as an example on this slide, what are the APIs that we can make in principle in India, which are cheaper than being importing them? I told you a little bit about energy, that uh, our imports of crude oil is very high and would like to reduce this particular import. But at the same time, humanity also is looking at alternate energy sources. We want to look at sources which are renewable, uh, sources which don't depend upon fossil fuels. And uh, there are many things that we are actually thinking about, but one of them is the lithium ion battery. What we expect is that the lithium ion battery market is set to grow at a CAGR at about, roughly about 32%. What we will do actually essentially is that instead of importing crude oil, we'll start importing lithium in such a way. Instead of depending on certain countries for import of crude oil, we'll start depending on some other countries for lithium ion. That also is not a sustainable model. And therefore, we have launched now a very major program on alternatives to lithium ion batteries, which can become viable in the coming five or six years. And this should actually be available, such as uh, sodium, aluminium, cadmium, and so on and so forth. And we do hope that we'll be able to come up with certain chemistry solutions, which will become as viable as the lithium ion in the coming years. The other area that what we import uh, a large amount are metals, minerals, and materials. And there is large opportunity ahead of us to even reduce these particular imports from other countries. Scrap iron, ferro alloys, aluminum wire, so on and so forth, are the areas where we can actually reduce our imports. Although we may not have our own sources, but recycling the scrap material that is exists that exists in India and other sources can be tapped so that these imports can be reduced to a substantial amount. And we have come up with a strategy for the reduction of these imports from other countries. And the strategy I've we briefly captured on this slide. I don't expect all of you to read this particular slide, but to show, just to let you know that there is a specific strategy in place so that we can reduce imports for this thing. So at the policy level, what we would like to do is that in order to decrease imports for all these essential items that I showed you, whether it be oils or chemicals or materials and minerals or any other matter, what we must do, we must become more vocal for local. And of course, the Honorable Prime Minister has given a clarion call on becoming Atma Nirbhar. Uh, I'm glad that because of the COVID, the only one good thing that has happened because of COVID is that it has made most of us very aware of our major import problem. And when we import, we must ensure that we have the same quality criteria, which is benchmarked globally. We have the same criteria for life cycles and guarantees, which are benchmarked globally. And if we were to do that, saying that we must adopt the same quality criteria, we must adopt the same life cycle and guarantee criteria, to be able to be globally competitive. And to do this, the science and technology cannot remain in our academic labs. They cannot remain in the universities. They cannot remain within the IITs and IIC. We must have private partners who can come on board and they can scale up uh, our technologies. So the promotion of public-private partnership, which till uh, a few years ago was actually seen as a very uh, sinful word, is we must shed that uh, Dr. Mahdi, we seem to have lost your audio. Oh. Are you able to hear me? 
Yes, yes. No, no. Now it's working. Thank you. Yeah. Let me go ahead. So uh, are you able to see my slide now? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So uh, public-private partnership, which was actually seen to be a very sinful word uh, till uh, a few years ago, we have to shed our sinful uh, habits and we have to promote public-private partnerships in order to achieve this vocal for local strategy. Some of the other possible strategies to decrease imports are we must design for recycle and reuse. Uh, we must ban and restrict the products which are for one-time use. And we must keep in our mind environmental liability for future. In fact, there are many people around the world and also in India, they're very vocal about an index called gross environmental product. Just like GDP, people are also talking about GEP as one of the criteria to measure whether your technology is going to be sustainable or not. And we must adopt those kind of processes to be able to compete globally in all our processes and to reduce our carbon footprint or to reduce the anthropogenic activity on the environment, anthropogenic uh, possibilities on the uh, anthropogenic uh, negative impact on humanity, uh, on the environment. The other area that what we learned in COVID-19 uh, is uh, something which is very revealing. And Professor Paransme mentioned in his uh, inaugural uh, statement, and I like that statement very much, that just as much as the social sciences people have felt alienated from the natural sciences people, uh, over the years, the natural sciences people have also increasingly felt alienated from the social sciences and humanities people in the recent times. And it is a brilliant example of that. COVID-19 is an absolutely brilliant example of that. When we were devising a strategy uh, for COVID-19 mitigation, the scientists hardly foresaw that there is going to be a, such a massive reverse migration of people from urban areas to rural areas. And I just wish that we actually work very closely with social sciences in the last several years than only doing it now. So as a future strategy, the social sciences and the humanities people must learn to work with the scientists and vice versa. The science and technology, unless we integrate with all other disciplines of human endeavor, I don't think humanity or our country is going to make any further progress. And as I said, this is a good revelation that what we had is the reverse migration of people from urban to rural areas. But there are elegant solutions for this. Now that we have realized that massively people have moved to rural areas and we have to provide the people in rural areas respectful, way, respectful ways of sustaining their own lives, we must have technological intervention so that they can lead very respectable life in their own local settings. And for that, we must generate good infrastructure by interventions of technologies, such as roads, bridges, housing. We must ensure for, uh, education reach to all of them, schooling and artistry. We must teach them self-sustenance skills, and we must provide them proper healthcare, and we must provide them local energy solutions. Apart, apart from that, there are many other things that we can actually talk about, but all of these integrated together there is no doubt that the economy in the rural areas can start booming. And if you do that, we'll have an inclusive growth of the entire country in the coming time. So once again, science and technological interventions in the development of rural economy are going to be very, very important in the coming time. And as I said, we must integrate all aspects of human endeavor for knowledge generation for all these things. What would be the roadmap for our citizens? I would suggest there are only a few suggestive points that I would like all the public to participate actively in all the R&D efforts in India. When I say this, I don't mean to say that every person has to be taught or has to be involved in doing actual R&D. What I mean to say is that innovation does not require formal training in any of the areas. Innovation can come from any common citizen of the country. And as long as our mind is open for doing innovation, that can contribute significantly for the development of R&D. The local problems, the local solutions, and the kind of jugaad that we are known for, if we keep our mind open 
for all of these innovations can come in and it will automatically catapult uh, R&D in India. And that's what all the common citizens must actually do. As for the scientists and technologists in the country, we must bring best practices of SNT to India. I don't mean to say that we don't have best practices of SNT, but the best practices of SNT can also be evolved by considering all the stakeholders in this particular arena. We must consult industry, we must consult our society at large so that these practices can be brought in for our uh, development of SNT. We must help garner support for reducing bureaucratic, bureaucratic control in the creative fields. Many of us feel that there is excessive bureaucracy in our country. We all know that the origins of bureaucracy go to the British era. But it's also a common saying that the British left the country, but they left behind this burgeoning bureaucracy on our country. And we must make sure that these controls are reduced as much as possible if we were to promote all the creative thinking in the country. Import substitution is not only making India slogan, which should appear to be a very hollow uh, goal for us. We should also be to be able to ready. Uh, we should be ready for forecasting the future and be ready for it. The number of calamities which are staring at us at this moment. They are going to be. They are going to be para pandemics such as COVID-19 even in future. They may not be COVID-19, but other viruses and bacteria and parasites are waiting to strike humanity. But there's also a real danger staring at us. And that is the climate change. Scientists in the last several years have been crying that there is climate change. There is evidence for climate change. And we have not been able to convince the society that a climate change is real. And that going to be much more catastrophic than the pandemic that we are facing it right now. Trust me, climate change, when it hits us, is going to be an absolute catastrophe for the entire humanity. And therefore, we must be future ready to handle that calamity right now. And we must have strategies for long-term development of the country. So for the preparedness of the pandemics, my last couple of slides would be to be uh, develop the ability to predict the pandemics, to create world-class infrastructure in India in terms of science and technology, so that during the times of such calamities, science and technological solutions can be deployed very quickly. It's a great example. Because China, we are able to cover the COVID-19 pandemic very quickly in China. Many other countries were not able to do that. Some of the most advanced countries, economies in the world, were not able to replicate the same thing as China did. But China was able to do that principally because it had a world-class infrastructure in place. And as soon as they realize what kind of steps can be taken to get out of it very quickly, they did that very, very effectively. And we must replicate that in India. We must develop ability to manufacture equipments locally for the Atmanibar Bharat call that Honorable Prime Minister has given. And we must prepare robust supply chains for all supplies. So supply chain is going to be critical in the coming years for every atom that we actually think of. That's important that we do it now. So the strategy for preparedness of future pandemics would be fourfold, strengthen the academic R&D institutions, strengthen the industry academic partnerships, the public private partnerships, so that we promote R&D and innovation. We promote startup uh, ecosystem and the MSMEs in the country. And we also promote rural entrepreneurship. If we follow these four mantras, I have no doubt that a country would be very firmly on the path of development in the coming years. What we would also like to propose is a strategic think tank for science and technology. We already have strategic think tank in the country in terms of Niti Aayog. So I don't mean to say that we should actually have overlapping mandate as Niti Aayog, but a strategic think tank in SNT can have much larger, or rather a more focused mandate than the Niti Aayog. It can therefore be very complementary and supplementary to Niti Aayog in, term, in terms of evolving policies for governing, governing SNT, which should be very dynamic, which should be very evidence-based, and should be suitable for the Indian milieu. The strategic think tank, must consist uh, a, a, a very inclusive uh, group that will have youth and experience and should be balanced by all respect. It should integrate all aspects 
of not only health research, but all angles of science and technology into this. And there are many other things that we can actually talk about how we can do that. But this, I think, would be a very good way forward for doing the future. So in a sense, what I've actually tried to tell you is a bit of history of how SND developed in India. I've tried to tell you how COVID-19 taught us uh, very uh, compelling lessons for future. And what I've tried to tell you is that what are the potential solutions to move ahead uh, from these particular lessons that what we have learned in COVID-19. Uh, I'm so privileged that I'm able to put my thoughts in front of all of you today. And I do hope that you go back with some positivity out of this particular thing. I do hope that you all support our science and technology endeavors in this respect. Thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandi. That was a very informative as well as inspiring talk. And uh, thank you for, as I said once again, for taking time out of your really busy schedule. I know again at six o'clock, you will have that task force meeting. And, uh, you know, as a common citizen of India, I want to express my gratitude, uh, not only to you, to CSIR, but also to our Honorable Minister, because uh, Dr. Harsh Vardhan has been really fighting this from the front and uh, uh, not only allaying fears and busting some myths and misconceptions, but also, uh, I think, taking uh, the appropriate measures to combat the pandemic. And for us, you mentioned climate change. One of the uh, deadliest things about pandemics is it's, these are fat-tailed events. They seem to be small. And then the risks of scale are so immense that hundreds of thousands of people die. So, you know, obviously there's a risk in crossing the road. You may get run over. But it doesn't mean that thousands or millions will be run over. Whereas in a pandemic, once we see how a virus is infecting people, then it just scales up in a way that it overwhelms our systems. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we have competent people at the helm of affairs in India to help us through. I'm sure there are many questions, but I had one more reflection just before we throw it open to our fellows, some of whom are trained in science, but most of us are in humanities and social sciences. Uh, you mentioned something really important, that the world of the future, in fact, when you said to be future ready, uh, in fact, the future shock is already the present shock. And uh, it seems to me that uh, one of the wonderful things you said is the need to integrate, you know, the different epistemologies, which from the time of the European Enlightenment have tended to drift apart in an analytical and you might say uh, you know, centrifugal manner going apart. And somehow we need a new integration. And you mentioned rural, urban, uh, you might say people science versus the elite science, all these wonderful uh, you know, uh, methods and processes of integration, as well as uh, you know, the clouds, uh, the terrible dark clouds, but the silver lining, where once we're shifting back to the rural, we are decongesting the urban spaces. And as you said, entrepreneurship, anybody, Jugard, anyone can be an entrepreneur. And we are seeing this. So there's a new ecosystem to encourage this so that uh, ordinary people can participate in this, I would say, upsurge of innovation and, and uh, creativity in India. And I was reminded of C.P. Snow's famous Reed lecture of 1959, talking about the two cultures. And I think, uh, uh, let's try to integrate. You have a wonderful institution, NISTADS. It used to be very active at one time. Uh, now, I'm not sure what kind of work they're doing. But I think the history of CSIR needs to be written from Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar to Shekhar Mande, you know. We need, we need a documentation of this wonderful organization. And as you said, those highlights when uh, ISRO was started, when and that meeting at NPL, as you said, and Homi Bhava, you know, the kind of respect he commanded. And now we are seeing in the Swiss Alps after the, you mentioned global warming, we're seeing the glacial melts and uh, we're getting new information about the plane crash of Homi Bhabha. So uh, what we want to say, uh, Dr. Mande, is we offer our facilities. We have a wonderful campus. Please come and visit. But if anybody wants to write a history of, of uh, CSIR, uh, you know, we, are, we offer our facilities as well as uh, an apartment for a fellow to come and write such a history. I think it will be 
a marvelous contribution to the integration that you spoke of. Uh, thank you once again. With these words now, I'm throwing it open. Uh, please uh, raise your hands if I can see you. Do I can't see a there number of you? I can't see. There are a couple of questions here already. So I'll answer okay. them if you permit me first. But, please, uh, please go ahead. Please go I'm, ahead. I'm glad you mentioned C.P. Snow, the 1962 essay of Tale of Two Cultures. And in, the, in that, he says that if I am very asked frequently by people, have you read Shakespeare? And C.P. Snow being a physicist, he said that's an equivalent of asking whether do you know uh, second law of thermodynamics to social science people, you know? And most of us don't understand each other's language. So that's a very interesting aspect that he wrote in that. But uh, there is a question by Dr. S.K. Chahal, uh, which says that what about the strategy of making sciences and social sciences together? And as very rightly pointed out, uh, also by you and Dr. Chahal, is that we have to have all the places of learning which integrate this together. You know, I mean, this uh, realization was not there even in our IITs and ISC till recently. And they have made some efforts, certain efforts in the having departments of social sciences in them. But I would say that is very apologetic effort at this stage. If we have to have proper social sciences, humanities schools in IITs and all, they must have 10 times the number of faculty they have today. The, in each of the IITs, if you see, they may have about five or six or maybe 10 faculty members who do that. We must have 100 faculty members who do that in IITs and ISC. Same thing in CSIR. You mentioned about NISTADs. Indeed, uh, we have a NISTADs, and our efforts are going to be in the coming years actually to try to strengthen NISTADs so that we can uh, integrate this aspect in CSIR as well. So to answer uh, very briefly Dr. Chahal's question, is essentially uh, make sure that any place of higher learning that is coming up in future, make it mandatory that uh, they have natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities integrated together. Uh, we have had uh, beautiful universities such as JNU, University of Hyderabad, and all. Uh, but even there, I feel there is a disconnect uh, between the different schools. But uh, nonetheless, at least they are on same geographic uh, uh, vicinity. And we should uh, try to promote that uh, on uh, that, at least that kind of uh, feeling if it's percolated to the faculty. It's a good starting point in the long term. Uh, there's a question by CN Subramaniam, uh, who would like to know that what is CSIR doing in sewage handling, waste management, and occupational health, which is the interface between industry and social justice, and also prepare us to fight pandemics in future? That's a very good question. Uh, we have a lab called National Environmental Engineering Research Institute, or abbreviated as NIRI. It's in Nagpur. And they look very closely at sewage handling and waste management. And in fact, uh, uh, we had recently given a proposal to the PSS office uh, to manage the Gazipur waste dump. And uh, that was awarded to one of the CSR labs, the Central Road Research Institute, along with a company called Ireland FS. And as luck would have it, Ireland FS went bankrupt just after the project was awarded. So we are back to square one. But uh, we are trying our best to see what best solutions can be arrived at for the best management in future. I mean, that's our effort, which is going to be. And we need prayers from all of you uh, in all of this. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Raju. Why India has, has not done as well as China in uh, controlling the pandemic? The answers are very simple. As I said, China was very well prepared in terms of its infrastructure and all. Just to give an example. When the pandemic hit China, right? It was not a pandemic yet. What actually hit them, what was called as cluster of pneumonia-like cases, symptoms. It was not known whether all of them are related or is pneumonia, some sort of pneumonia which is there and some sort of strange uh, uh, pneumonia that is hit the people of China. What China really did very quickly, their epidemiology team got together. They found out the cause. You know, I mean, the, 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 the pastures hypothesis is that there is a cause. And uh, the, 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 you have to find out what is the cause of the pneumonia symptoms. And they quickly isolated the causative organism, which turned out to be a virus. And they sequenced the genome. And they found out the genome matches what is called as the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and coronavirus. But it was not like SARS-CoV-1 is much more mutated than SARS-CoV-1. So they called it SARS-CoV-2. But they were able to do that in seven days flat. 
on 7th January 2020, they had an answer in their hand. 31st December, it was reported there is a cluster of things. What forbidden? If it hit India, we would still be struggling after a long time right, like this. Now, China has an excellent scientific infrastructure to do this. And it's an absolute need of the hour. I would like to urge if there are any government officials uh, or uh, ministry people from Ministry of Finance here, is we must set aside uh, consistently about 20 to 25,000 crores for improving India's scientific infrastructure for next five or 10 years very in a sustainable manner. If you are able to do that, there is no doubt that India also will meet uh, met China in terms of uh, our capability of dealing with future pandemics such as this. I also wanted to just add a footnote. This is a very positive answer, but there's another side. China is an authoritarian society. And uh, I think it was remarkable that uh, we had the method of persuasion for the first lockdown, which was almost 99% effective in terms of, uh, uh, you know, stopping, uh, you know, the transmission in the, in, in the initial stage. But the other side is we really don't know much about what's happening in China because the information is so tightly controlled that, uh, I mean, there are all kinds of reports of uh, 100,000 coffins or a missing uh, telephone sims to suggest that the actual toll and the caseload was much larger than is reported. So there's always that part. But I think the point about uh, really ramping up the, oh, I'm so glad you're having a, a coffee or tea. I mean, we would have loved to offer you, but you know, this is virtual. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, I, I was just saying that uh, we have to contend with the fact that we are a democratic society. But I think a point about ramping up science and technology infrastructure is really well taken. And the new NEP, the GDP percentage on education is also projected to go up considerably. And I think that unless we invest, uh, you know, we, are, we were always a knowledge society for thousands of years. You mentioned how 2,500 years ago, you know, we had the, uh, you know, metallurgy of a high order to be able to make the, uh, that, uh, you know, vanishing wax uh, way of uh, smelting, uh, 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 you know, and uh, kind of uh, alloy which has not rusted to this day. So we were always a knowledge society. It's, it's time to get back to that. And it's also so important to distinguish you know, science from pseudoscience, from non-science and nonsense, you know, because uh, th this is another problem that 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 we have. So uh, maybe that's my question to you, Dr. Mande. How do we, uh, this, you talked about cultivating the scientific temper. How do we make sure that, uh, you know, because of a lot of potential for disinformation on social media, how do we separate science from non-science which is, suppose I like Mozart instead of Beethoven. There's, uh, you know, that's not the purview of science. It's a purview of tastes and, you know, artistic uh, sensibility or whatever. But uh, if I start making claims, for instance, just to give you an example, that listening to Mozart is going to help cure COVID, then that's not only non-science, but that's probably nonsense. <laughs> and and then if I say something different by uh, by example that look I've got this uh, Ayurvedic medicine and uh, I, I don't want to call it coronel but we call it anything we like but it hasn't undergone the triple blind tests or whatever is required and so that becomes a kind of pseudoscience until it's actually proven so uh, my question to you uh, Dr Mandi is can you please uh, shed some light on these four categories Science, non-science, pseudoscience, and nonsense. That's right. So, very good, uh, very good point. Uh, science believes in evidence-based analysis, right? It could be observational, or it could be what actually can be done through experimentation, right? Uh, the observational thing, for example, is that uh, 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 do smokers have higher percentage of cancer, right? Now, obviously, you can't do an experiment on people, ask a control group of people to do more smoking and other control group of people do less smoking or something that cannot be done. But uh, based on simple statistics that how many smokers are there and who have developed cancer and all, one can actually come up with certain answers. 
which are very useful you know i mean uh, they can be tell us a lot about uh, the risk factors and things like that but uh, the example that you gave about ayurveda ayurveda was something like this it was actually based on observational I think we're losing your audio for some reason yeah so the example that you gave about ayurveda was essentially more observational in ancient times uh, like this having said that we must generate a proper scientific evidence for ayurvedic formulations if they work or the intended uh, think, uh, claim the uh, benefit okay you... good we lost your audio for a moment you were talking about uh, you know with smoking that there is an observational correlation uh, please please if you don't mind can you go back to that point because i yeah. think we lost yeah. your audio i have switched off my video to get better bandwidth so uh, right. uh, that's an observational uh, study where uh, you can't actually have people actually smoke and have half of people not smoke and come up with an experiment like that so uh, you just basically observe from how many people have smoked and how many people have developed cancer and how many of those who developed cancer were non smokers and then come up with certain conclusions based on that similarly ayurveda also was an observational science as it evolved over the years you know over centuries uh, it was observational